In this second lecture, I will highlight theories on the causes of migration. This is quite a challenge uh, in view of the great amount of theories there are on the causes of migration. Um, and I will try to summarize, particularly by trying to cluster those theories together in two main paradigms, and by trying to show how these different theories hang together, because although there has been quite some theoretical work on migration, it is often not linked to one another. Those theories tend to be self-standing, self-referring theories, which are not often connected. And I'll try to show how these different theories can be combined to a certain but limited extent and can reinforce one another. But it's important to understand how these different theories are part of two big families. And this is linked to more general social scientific theory because often we can make a distinction between the functionalist paradigm in social scientific theory and the historical structuralist paradigm in social scientific theory. And this is a useful way of looking at migration theories, but because despite the diversity, most migration theories can be grouped under one of these two paradigms and actually have similar assumptions. So both neoclassical and push-pull theories are both part of the broader functionalist paradigm in social theory. And I will explain why that is the case. Whereas neo-Marxist migration theory, dependency theory, world system theory, conflict theory are all part of the historical structuralist framework. Now, as you have seen already, for instance, neoclassical and neo-Marxist theories are not just migration theories, they are general theories about growth and development, particularly capitalist development. The same goes, for instance, for the world systems theory. There are very few theories here that are specific migration theories, but in some cases, like the neoclassical theory, they have developed and have applied their more general frameworks to study migration, but also, for instance, well, systems theory and neo-Marxist theory, we can derive from them certain assumptions about what drives migration. And indeed, theorists within these different theoretical fields have thought about migration. So it's not so much about developing separate migration theories, it's about understanding how these broader theories about development and change also have implications for migration. And this is one of the ways I'd like to illustrate that we can only increase our understanding of migration if we embed that understanding in broader socio-scientific theories. Now, the first group of theories are functionalist theories, also called equilibrium perspectives. Now, functionalist theories were the earliest theories in social sciences, which tended to see societies as a system, try to copy natural sciences, beginning in the 19th century. And it does theories tend to look at societies as a collection of interdependent parts with a tendency towards equilibrium, particularly the latter assumption is very important. So when we look at push-pull models or neoclassical migration theory or human capital theory, they are variations but they have similar assumptions. They all assume that migration is a place utility process. They are based on gravity assumptions, and particularly the assumption that migration processes lead to an equilibrium. And in the next few slides, I'll explain more what that entails. Now, to start with push-pull models, these are the sort of more most rudimentary form of migration theory. And you're probably all aware with them, of them, and, and they're often used still in research and policy. The problem is that they are very problematic. Now, normally push-pull models tend to mention factors like population density and origin regions, economic opportunities in the receiving in, uh, regions, and environmental factors as main causes of migration. So in origin societies, the narrative often goes as follows, that population growth causing a sort of Malthusian pressure on natural and agricultural resources further increased poverty 
and almost push people out of marginal rural areas. And more recently, this is also connected to the debate on climate change and environmental degradation, where also the assumption is that climate change and environmental degradation will increasingly force people to migrate. Now, on the receiving end, it's often the economic conditions, particularly higher wages, which are assumed to lure people into cities and industrial countries. As we see, the main problem with those theories is a high simplification of factors that lead to migration. But particularly, they have a very ambiguous and descriptive character. They often have the character of just a list of factors that seem to play a role in migration, but they don't actually specify the relative weight and importance. A second problem is that those models tend to single out particular phenomena like environment, population growth, to directly cause migration, which is very problematic because, for instance, the impact on population growth or migration is only direct. It just depends on opportunities. Um, for instance, look at the Gulf countries, which have very high population growth, but offer many economic opportunities and hardly anybody migrates away from those areas. Or the reverse case of many Eastern European countries where we see very low population growth or even negative growth and still people moving away. This is also the reason why we shouldn't assume that just environmental degradation is going to increase migration because that depends on the resources people can access, which can make them very resilient to environmental change and can even push innovation. Another problem is that push-pull models tend to rule out agency and preferences. preferences. They tend to portray migrants as passive pawns that are being pushed and pulled around by those forces. And this is the very essence of functionalist social theory. It somehow doesn't consider how people look at the world and their own independent decision making. The fourth problem is that push-pull models are a very static model which do not specify feedbacks. They're unable to see migration as an intrinsic part of broader development processes. So they do say something, although very problematically, about what causes migration, but they do not say anything about how migration itself impacts on those processes, and all other theories do so. And this also explains that they're unable to resolve empirical paradoxes. For instance, most migration does not occur from the poorest areas to the richest areas. Most migration occurs between areas that are, have relatively similar levels of development. Most people move to degraded and populated areas instead of the reverse, which also proves some of those assumptions wrong. And how to deal with return migration? If people are pushed and pulled by certain macro factors, why will people bother returning? And these are just a few examples of why push-pull models might be useful as an explanatory device at secondary schools that do not really classify as a migration theory. Now, neoclassical theories are much more sophisticated and provide a much more elaborate framework for understanding migration. It is useful to distinguish macro-level and micro-level neoclassical theories about migration. Macro-level theories tend to explain migration by looking at geographical differences in the relative, scarce, relative scarcity of capital and labor within and across countries. And migrant workers are expected to move to capital abundant areas and high skilled workers and capital to capital scarce areas. So basically, workers from south to north and capital from north to south. And this is for the benefit of all, because it leads to a more optimal allocation of production factors. And free migration, within this perspective, is expected to lead to more efficient aggregate outcomes, which is why many neoclassical theorists and policy makers which base their model, the policy models on neoclassical theories, favor liberal immigration policies. And this process of capital and labor moving in opposite direction is predicted to lead to a process of so-called factor price equalization, which eventually will lead to wage convergence. Now, the underlying assumption is that once this equilibrium is achieved, 
of wage conver convergence that migration will cease. So migration is just a response to wage differentials explained by the different availability of capital and labor across the world. But once this gap has been closed, we won't expect migration to occur. As we will see later, this is a fundamentally problematic assumption. Now, my, on the micro level, neoclassical theory tends to look at migration as utility or income maximizing behavior of rational individuals. And it assumes that decisions to migrate are based on, on, the, on a sort of cost-benefit calculation. Now, the assumptions are that migrants have free choice, no constraints, and have full access to information. And that migrants are simply expected to go there where they can be most productive. As we will see as well, this is a problematic assumption. Still, there have been refinements and extensions of the neoclassical migration theories. Particularly Todaro and Harris introduced the expected earnings concept, which means that we have to include other factors in just wages, but also in employment levels, which can, for instance, explain why people move to cities in um, um, developing countries, even though and employment levels may be higher in cities, but as long as wages are still much more higher, um, then people will still migrate. So as long as the expected income gain, if you control expected income, uh, if you, if you um, multiply this by the uh, unemployment rate, then the employment rate, then if the expected income is still higher than the one uh, earned in, for instance, rural areas, you can still uh, assume people to migrate. Now, these theories were initially developed for internal migration, and later on they have been applied to international migration by theories like Borjas, and but also illegal migration, um, to include also many other factors than just income gains, such as the risks and costs of migration. A very rich extension of the neoclassical migration theory, which uh, makes it a much more sort of elaborate framework is the application of human capital theory to migration. And people who've worked on these theories have looked at different and expected returns on investments uh, by different individuals depending on their human capital set. So it basically means if people have different levels of education, different particular skills and knowledge, we can explain migration selectivity. Why do people, certain people migrate? And why actually most people don't migrate? And the idea is that migration decisions are guided by comparing lifetime earnings, depending on your skill set, in alternative geographical locations. Which means that only particular individuals who are expected to gain most from migrating to particular destinations will eventually move. And that is a very strong explanation why actually most people don't move. It's particular individuals, often the higher educated and the younger, who tend to migrate much more than others. But this highlights the importance to look at the differentiation and structure of labor markets, not just at wage levels or at employment levels, but really try to see what is the particular demand for particular forms of particular migrants in particular sectors of the labor market. And as we will see another, uh, later in this lecture, this provides a potential link to segmented labor market theory. It also highlights the need to consider income distributions in sending and receiving countries simultaneously. And this can explain migration without big income differentials. If there's a certain mismatch between supply and demand, we might expect, within a country, we might expect migration to occur. Now, it's, there has been a lot of criticism on those neoclassical migration theories, in particular on their assumptions. The idea that markets are perfect is, of course, problematic, particularly in low developed countries. And the neoeconomics of labor migration, which we will review at the end of this lecture, is an attempt to fill this gap and to, 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 to follow up on this criticism. The same for the full information assumption is very unrealistic, and some of the theories about the continuation of migration will build upon that critique. All people are constrained in their choice to some extent, so the idea that people are free and constrained 
is very problematic, exactly because, for instance, markets are not perfect. People do not have access to full information. Another problem is that they have a very narrow focus on economic factors. And of course, although economic factors seem to play a big role, other opportunity differentials, like differences in freedom, um, and political freedoms or social cultural freedoms, uh, different lifestyles, also seem to play a big role in migration. And the lack of agency does not account for aspirations, preferences, and different responses of individuals to those big macro forces. Moreover, neoclassical theories tend to ignore power inequalities, social contradictions, and conflict, and most particularly the role of states. And structuralist theories, which we review later, try to fill that gap. Another problem is that migration does not seem to occur along the largest wage differentials, which we would expect based on neoclassical theories. And actually, the, the link between development and migration is much more complex than the theory does seem to suggest. And transition theories, which we will review in the last lecture, will deal with this issue. And they will also improve our understanding about why is it that highly developed societies are highly mobile and have significant emigration levels. The second family, the second paradigm, is the historical structural paradigm. And it's linked to the idea of asymmetric growth that generally economic processes linked to capitalist expansion and economic growth do not lead to greater equilibrium, but rather the other way around. And it also highlights the role of migration within those theoretical frameworks, which is expected not to lead to less differences, for instance, wages and other opportunities, but actually seems to deepen inequalities and development problems. Historical structural theories have much more eye the perspective of the state and power, and they're rooted in neo-Marxist political economy. And some examples of historical structural theories are the dependency theory, which basically says that underdevelopment has been the result of a process of exploitation by rich countries, which is linked to the world systems theory developed by Wallerstein, which divides the world up in core countries, peripheral countries, and semi-peripheral countries, where basically world development, the whole processes of globalization and internationalization that have taken place over the last centuries, to start with colonization by Europeans, have deepened international inequalities because developed in the core was dependent on exploitation of the periphery, and migration is part of that process. Also, globalization theories uh, by, for instance, uh, as highlighted, for instance, by Saskia Sassen, are, can be grouped within the same group of theories that also tend to see migration as an exploitation mechanism, where migrant labor basically serves the industries and the interests of uh, the industries and the interests of the high skilled living in wealthy countries and wealthy cities. This is linked to the idea of the new international division of labor and the notion of dual and segmented labor markets, which, in this, which makes, it, m makes us understand why even under situations of high unemployment amongst non-migrants, there can still be a demand for migrant labor. To start with the state, historical structuralist perspective very much focus on the role that states play because states are powerhouses and particularly the colonial states and the states of the, the, the wealthy countries in the world that actively have stimulated migration. First of all, by the experience of colonialism. Colonialism itself is a movement out of Europe, but it has also triggered forms of labor migration between former colonies and from colonies to uh, the colonizing countries. And indentured labor and labor recruitment are clear examples of how migration has been very actively stimulated. And the issue is that once those migrant movements have been put in motion, they often led to more migration later on. And also in post-colonial times, those dependencies between 
colonizing nations and former colonies are perpetuated. We still see a lot of migrants moving from X British colonies to Britain and from X French, X French colonies to France. Military occupation is known also to play a big place uh, role in migration. For instance, the U.S. Um, um, US uh, interference in the war in South Korea has led to a significant uh, reverse migration processes, for instance, uh, because American servicemen married South Korean women. So occupation often leads to a counterflow. And of course, migration policies and trade relations all shape migration processes. Now, historical structuralists argue that economic and political power is unequally distributed amongst developed and underdeveloped countries, and that people have fundamentally secured an unequal access to resources. And it would be naive to assume that then migration would lead to a distribution, a more equal distribution of resources. Now, the power inequalities explain why capitalist expansion and migration processes, which are part of that, reinforce those inequalities. Instead of modernizing and progressing, and the developed countries are trapped by the disadvantaged position in the global political structure. And then migration is to be viewed as a natural outgrowth of those disruptions and dislocations that are intrinsic to the process of capitalist accumulation. And that, for instance, free trade and modern agriculture uproot presence from poor countries, and they then become an international labor reservoir that can be easily exploited by capital. Let me review a few of those theories and what they have to say about migration. Dependency theory, the idea of development of underdevelopment, and Frank has been one of the front runners of this school, sees the true source of underdevelopment in the expansion of world capitalism. So the idea that capitalism will solve the problem is very naive in this view. And these views were very, very popular, particularly in the 1970s and 1980s. And that migration is one of the manifestations of global capitalism. And migration is not the solution to development. Rather, it seems to be one of the causes of underdevelopment. Why? Because migration ruins stable peasant societies, because it leads to the departure of valuable skills and labor from sending societies so that people cannot contribute to production, for instance, on the family farm. But also, if high-skilled people move out, this will lead to a brain drain. So that effectively, a migration from high and low-skilled people undermines economies of origin societies and uproots their population. And the sort of policy response to that is and has been in many uh, developing countries that we have to present, prevent migration in order to encourage autonomous, autarkic economic growth. For instance, consider the policies of socialist and communist states which have tried to prevent migration for many reasons, but this has been one of them. Another theory which has been pioneered by Piori is the dual or segmented labor market theory, which doesn't focus on the motives of individual migrants, but argues that international migration stems from the intrinsic labor market demands of modern industrial societies. And it is possible to create some links between this theory and the human capital theory. Now, Piora puts forward a range of explanation why there is a chronic and unavoidable demand for foreign workers in wealthy societies. Now, in this lecture, I don't have time to go into full detail, but a book by Castles and Miller and Piora's own work highlight those reasons in more detail. But his key argument is that in Western societies, in rich societies, we see a high degree of economic, economic dualism, where we see a bifurcated labor market. On the one hand, a skilled, secure, capital-intensive sector, where people have secured jobs, and another sector, which is much more labor-intensive, unstable, and unskilled of nature where we have dangerous and dirty and demeaning jobs, as they're often being labeled. Now, and this bifurcation is the idea is reinforced by neoliberal labor market policies, leading to the increase of casual, flexible, and informal forms of labor. 
and that low wage levels are held down or may fall as a result of the inflow of cheap labor. So basically, that low skilled immigration, despite discourses to the contrary, do serve the interests of capital and industry and employers. The key point of this theory is the demand of immigrant workers grows out of the structure of the economy. And it again highlights the role of recruitment by employers and governments. That migration isn't a sort of spontaneous process in many cases, but is often set in motion by very active recruitment of governments and employers in the North, once again questioning the idea how unwanted is this migration and somehow highlighting the quite high gap between discourses proclaiming that we want less migration, but actually in practice we see a high level of recruitment. Think for instance about the role of temporary recruitment agencies. More recent theories about neoliberal globalization and the new international divisions of labor sort of built upon that framework, but try to consider this from a more global developmental perspective. Trying to look at the relocation of industries and growing outsourcing, and the increasing labor participation of women in wealthy societies, increased education and immigration of the high skilled, which particularly tend to cluster in global cities, and a decreasing labor market participation of women, uh, in particular, has created a strong demand for services from unskilled workers which have led to a transnational movement, especially from former colonies. And the key point again is that international migration has little to do with wage rates or employment differentials between countries. It follows from the dynamics of market creation and the structure of the global economy, which is fundamentally unequal and tends to lead to segmented labor markets. And this can make it understandable that in situations where a lot of non-migrants are unemployed, refuse to work in some of these low status sectors, and that the work in those sectors are st is still being done increasingly by migrants. Just think about, for instance, agriculture, catering, um, and the care sector, and also domestic help sector, where which have become increasingly migrant sectors in many countries. Now, if we compare these sort of historical structural theories with equilibrium and functionalist perspectives, they have something in common. They're both rooted in modernization theory, but their predicted outcomes are fundamentally different. Structuralist theories tend to emphasize that the overall results are not just the sum of all individual decisions, but it's rather the other way around, that the structure of the global economy and labor markets which determines where migrants move. So the level of freedom is much lower than functionalist theories tend to assume. And that in receiving area societies, therefore migration serves the interests of capital owners and undermines the interests of native workers. In sending societies, migration, these structural theories argue, serves the interests of elites because of its function as a sort of safety valve. So that potentially rebellious and discontented people move away, and this might actually prevent political reform and revolutions, as long as the unemployed and potential, um, um, potential people who will contest against regimes will move away. It might be in their interest that migration continues. As long as unemployment is held down by emigration, it serves the interests of elites. And that in that perspective, we might also gain another understanding of restrictive immigration policies. It may serve the interests of capital as they increase the number of migrants without a legal status, who are in the end easy to exploit and will demand lower wages and will complain less. It's not to say that this framework is necessarily universally true. It is important to look at both perspectives. So the functionalist and structural perspective has two lenses at which to look at a very rich migration reality. And if we fundamentally understand both perspectives, we might develop a much more critical view about why, for instance, policymakers speak in a certain way but might behave in a different way. Now, there are a lot of critiques on these historical structuralist models. For instance, the assumption of an immobile peasant community that people were uprooted, whereas we know that uh, pre-modern societies were highly mobile. 
so that people came from a sort of romantic past is quite difficult. And it's also linked to the assumption that pre-modern society, before capitalism started, were prosperous and egalitarian, which is of course a very problematic assumption. Now, like functionalist theories, also structuralist theories have not a lot of eye for agency. They also tend, and even more than the functionalist theories, to depict individual migrants as rather passive parts of big macro-structural forces, which is problematic if we look at empirical evidence showing that migrants, of course, do to a certain extent make their own active choices to improve their circumstances. And there is, of course, a lot of counter-evidence that inclusion of regions and countries into global capitalism is not necessarily leading to their demise and further into development. We seem to see certain cases like that. For instance, perhaps in, um, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but of course, the East Asian example has shown us the contrary. So we cannot just take for granted that this is always the mechanism. And in certain cases, migration can play a very positive role. We we'll come back to that in the lecture on migration and development. So we've now reviewed the sort of big, two big groups of theories. Now, as I've said, the big drawback of those theories is that they're quite deterministic. They don't have a lot of eye for agency. Now, over the past two decades, roughly, two to three decades, we've seen the rise of a whole new set of more pluralist theories that try to bridge this divide and try to ascribe a much bigger role to agency. And these theories include the new economics of labor migration, so-called livelihood perspectives of migration, and transnational theory. Now, on your reading list, you'll find much more about this, but I'd like to highlight one particular theory, which is the new economics of labor migration, to illustrate how theories can successfully include both notions of structure and agency which then leads to a much richer understanding and also new ideas about what caused migration, which might well complement the first two families of theories. And it highlights the necessity to integrate actor and structure perspectives, because we need to understand real-life migration processes, in which, of course, both agency and structure are important. And this is the only way to see migration as an intrinsic part of broader change. And the key issue is the following, that within a given set of structural constraints, migration have a certain freedom within which they can exert agency by making migration decisions at T1. So they can, for instance, choose between particular destinations, but that such agency at T1 alters structural conditions in T2, which then also affects future migration decisions. So potentially leading to a different migratory agency at T2. So it's the feedback that also changes the structure and the broader context within future migration decisions are, being, are, are taking place. Now let me highlight the new economics of labor migration to wrap up this lecture. This theory has been formulated by Odette Stark and his colleagues in reaction to the inability of neoclassical theory to deal with migration in the developing world. Particularly the assumption about well-functioning markets and full information is, of course, very hard, very problematic. And also the uh, assumption that migration allowed to be unconstrained, particularly to explain migration within and across developing countries, is highly problematic. And the theory tried to place the behavior of migrants in a wider constraining social context. By not just considering migration as an individual act, but looking at how migration decisions are often made by the household, and that the household or the family is often the most appropriate decision-making unit. And such a perspective allows to integrate other factors than individual income maximization and migration decision-making. It's important to understand the context in which migration uh, occurs in many developing countries, because often credit, risk markets, and other markets fail and people don't have access to public social security institution. So the main aim of many poor households in developing countries is to manage and minimize risk. And this opens up a, a totally new sort of avenue of explanations of migration, that perhaps migration is not always necessarily 
primarily about maximizing income, but is often, and this is what's highlighted by a lot of empirical research, part of a household strategy to diversify risks to start with. If you are a peasant household entirely dependent on agriculture, you have a motive to diversify risks. For instance, in the case of crop failure due to, to a drought, you will have another source of income. So it can be rational, even without expecting any gain in income, to have one member of your household working in the city or abroad, so that you diversify your income risks. This is a very powerful explanation why we see migration to the big cities in developing countries, even when we ask ourselves why would people bother go there because circumstances are so dismal. But if it's part of a diversification strategy, it does make sense. Secondly, migration within this perspective is also a strategy to overcome market constraints. For instance, remittances play a big role in funding, serving as investment capital for families and households in origin countries. So if people don't have access to credit, if they can't get credit with the bank, because of failing institutions or the lack of collateral, remittance can play a big key role in raising this investment capital. And then migrants become target savers. The third explanation is that NELM has theorized that migration is also a response not to absolute deprivation, but to relative deprivation. And that partly migration is an effort to keep up with Jones. Particularly when already people have migrated, and they increase the status, it might motivate other people to migrate as well. So the higher the inequality in origin societies, the lower the social security, the more institutions will fail to, 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 to reduce risks, the more migration we can expect. So risk diversification can explain the occurrence of migration in the absence of wage differentials. And migration may also serve to overcome credit mark constraints by raising capital to invest in business, or for instance, in other issues like education or health of family members back home. And remittances do not play any role in neoclassical migration theory because migrants are just considered individuals or maximize their own individual income. Within neoeconomics of labor migration, they're perceived as one of the most essential motives to migrate because Remittance enable relatively poor households to, one, reduce their income risks and poverty, two, to increase their income and living standards, and to potentially raise investment capital. And I tried to highlight the new economics of labor migration to show how it combines uh, considerations of individual and, and household decision making within broader constraints where people make active choices as an attempt to overcome those constraints. Now, the level and the extent to which they can overcome those constraints, that is quite a different issue, and we will deal with this in the lecture on migration and development. Now, final word on all these theories. It is not true that we can just combine and just mix all these theories, because some of the assumptions are fundamentally conflicting. But I think it is very important not to try to buy into one particular train of thought in terms of theories. What I think is that these different theories show how rich an explanation of migration there is and how many different angles there are to look at this phenomenon and how fundamentally wrong it would be just to portray migration as a response to push and pull factors, but instead to try to look at the complex ways in which migration is an intrinsic part of broader change processes, development and social transformation.